like to call the session to order now, please. Um, first of all, very welcome everybody to Visions of Labour and Class in Ireland and Europe 2023 to this afternoon's session. And again, we want to acknowledge uh, the support of our sponsors, uh, the Department of Tourism, Dublin County Council and all the unions and other companies that have uh, contributed uh, to making this uh, possible. So this looks like a very interesting session, so I'm not going to uh, go into long introductions because as you know, you have, your, um, you have the, the biogs in, in the program. Um, so could I call on Peter Murray from Maynooth University um, to give his lecture first of all, thank you. Okay, I'm going to start just talking about uh, a little about Americanization, this, this concept or term. Um, the period since 1945 is commonly characterized as the American century. Uh, it marks the emergence of the United States as a, as a superpower on the world stage. And um, a number of, of just key aspects of this quickly. Uh, Post-war U.S. economic aid uh, to, to warn stricken Europe uh, provided le leverage for an agenda of trade liberalization and a European economic integration. The NATO military alliance and other alliances were c was constructed under uh, US dominance, the notion of the West or the free world uh, led by the United States was very much embodied in these. And in production you had the, the, the export of Fordist methods, the uh, the high productivity model that the uh, US mass production industry had developed uh, that was exported all over the world to Europe first and then further afield. And in consumption, we saw innovations like the self-service supermarket and the shopping mall uh, also uh, crossing the Atlantic. Uh, in culture, you have new media like television uh, consolidated the influence that Hollywood films had earlier established. Uh, and then obviously you say nothing of things like rock and roll or the contemporary uh, social media. Now, in this paper, I'm going to be talking really about, about the uh, Americanization context for reshaping of uh, Ireland's organized labor movement since the Second World War. Uh, so just briefly to glance at the uh, principal external influences that have uh, uh, operated to, to shape Irish trade unionism. And I think we can say that there are three principal ones. Uh, there's the British origins of, of our trade union structures and the ongoing entanglements uh, with Britain and the British heritage, the fact that the, Ice, the Irish Congress uh, straddles a border between two states, Ireland, the Republic of Ireland and the United Kingdom, etc. So that's uh, pretty familiar territory. There's also the uh, European aspect, the, the, the Irish membership of the United the, what was then the EEC is now the European membership, uh, has been an important uh, context for, for, for labor movement uh, development. Uh, and then there's the third one, which I'm going to be talking about, which is uh, US state aid and flow, and also the flow of private corporate investment that has occurred since 1945. So these are kind of se sequential US state aid occurs in the early post-45 de decades. Uh, the, the corporate investment comes a bit later and is, uh, the flow is still ongoing, as we know. Um, so let's talk about the U.S. state aid, first of all. Um, U.S. state aid in the post-war period is provided directly through the European Recovery Program, to give the Marshall Plan its official title, uh, which ran from 1948 to 1951. Uh, and Ireland benefited from this by, uh, for low, by mostly in the... the the form of loans uh, to a small number, a small amount of dollar grants, and also technical assistance and productivity programs. Um, the, 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 the flow of, of direct US aid uh, was cut off at the end of 1951 uh, when the, uh, the United States sought uh, basically retrospectively to alter the a uh, treaty, uh, uh, essentially what was happening was there was a move from economic cooperation to mutual security in the context of the hotting up of, the, obviously the Cold War had started and it had, it had moved into a hot war phase in Korea. So there was much more emphasis in US policy uh, on 
less on the economic and more on the military. Now, Ireland had uh, declined to, to join NATO, uh, and it also declined to, to make changes in its retrospectively in its treaty with the United States in the light of mutual security legislation, and uh, aid was cut off uh, abruptly at the end of 1951. Now, the money had stopped flowing a couple of months prior to this, so what was left in the pipeline was technical assistance and productivity programs. Uh, it's, uh, there were uh, quite a, a number of, of U.S. Uh, efficiency expert lines up to come over and uh, run the rule over Irish industries. Uh, they never arrived, and it's, uh, it's uh, one of the what-ifs of Irish industrial history uh, if, if these people had come and, and if, uh, what, what their, if their prescriptions were, uh, uh, were implemented. Uh, but that never happened. Now, USA continued uh, uh, throughout the 1950s, uh, and uh, Ireland continued to, to sort of be indirectly affected by this. It, it wasn't receiving direct US aid after 51, uh, but indirectly the, the, it was still in the loop, uh, just about. Uh, and and <clears throat> this is because the US, what was the technical assistance and productivity aspects of the Marshall Plan, were continued to an agency called the European Productivity Agency, which was an agency within an agency. Uh, the, the umbrella agency was the Organization for European Economic Cooperation. All members of the, uh, all recipients of Marshall Aid had to join the OEEC, uh, uh, and they, had, they were supposed to coordinate their, their, their programs for recovery within that, uh, that umbrella organization. Uh, it continued to function throughout the 1950s, and uh, within it was created this European Productivity Agency. Uh, that the money for this, it wouldn't have existed without American money, uh, and, and uh, so, so it, it can reasonably be regarded as indirect US aid. It was formerly a European organization, uh, but the money for it all came from the United States. And it functioned up until 1962. Uh, now, Ireland uh, had little to do with it in its early years. The Department of Industry and Commerce, the main uh, department, uh, had a pretty indifferent attitude towards it. But as you get the sort of the, the, the Whitaker economic development uh, uh, changes coming in at the, the late 50s, uh, there's a much more active engagement that the Irish National Productivity is, Committee is, 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 is created, uh, and uh, there's a, a rush to get resources uh, uh, into Ireland uh, from, uh, from the EPA. <coughs> now, the aid era, the, the era of direct or, or indirect US uh, aid, ends as the OEEC is transformed into the OECD that we're kind of familiar with. The OEEC basically worked itself out of a job. It, 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 um, uh, the, the recovery, the, the rapid recovery of the European economies uh, fr from the dire straits in which they were in at the end of the 40s through the, the, day, the following decade meant that they'd, they'd close the gap really with the United States, that it was possible to, uh, to trade and, 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 and uh, integrate economies uh, <coughs> basically uh, without uh, having a, a, a stream of dollars pump, continuously pumped into them. Uh, and and so, so the idea, so the decision was taken to transform the OEC, OEEC into the OECD. So it would no longer be something that provided aid uh, in, in the form of money and then technical assistance, but it would be uh, an organization that provided essentially an analysis uh, so, uh, of, of policy and so forth uh, to member states. At this stage, the US became a member. It had previously uh, been, been, been outside the organization, it, it pumped money into, in, into it, uh, but it hadn't been a member of it. Now it became a member uh, and, 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 and it became a, a sort of a, an organization of developed economies. OECD continued to, 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 as a minor part of its activities to provide some uh, technical assistance of the kind that was, that was previously done through the Marshall Plan and the EPA. Uh, to play, uh, areas that were in, described as being in the process of development. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, Ireland didn't avail itself of this facility, uh, and the reason it didn't do that was because by uh, 1962, uh, it was, uh, Ireland was seeking to become a member of the EEC. It was seeking to become a full member of the EEC, it wanted membership, not association, uh, so it had to represent itself as a developed economy that could take on the responsibilities and. Uh, and, and, 
and function within uh, uh, the EEC context. Uh, and from that point of view, uh, you didn't want to be seen as somebody who needed technical assistance and, and, uh, and aid to, to develop. <coughs> now, the principal legacy of, of USAID uh, might be said to be the, the USAID programs promoted uh, what's been termed the politics of productivity. And this was the idea of a collaboration between capital, organized labor, and the state in pursuit of economic growth uh, and, and the rhetoric of, of, of productivity uh, uh, <coughs> linked uh, this, this pursuit of productivity to a sharing out of the resultant benefits between the, the three parties. Uh, this collaboration was one of the precursors of, in, of, of later social partnership mechanisms in Ireland. Uh, as I mentioned, the Irish National Productivity Committee came in, uh, to existence in, in, in 1959. Uh, and, and was quickly followed by the uh, Committee on Industrial Organization. So these are some of the earliest uh, uh, of the uh, sort of neo-corporatist uh, tripartite mechanisms that, that uh, later developed into something much more elaborate. Um, <coughs> the EPA and other arms of the OECD also helped to prepare the ground for the transform transformative expansion and reorientation of Irish second and third level education. We associate this with the OECD uh, Investment in Education Report in 1965, but a lot of the, the spade work uh, was done for this under the, back into the 50s. In particular, the, the, there was a rush to, uh, after the, Russia, the Soviet Sputnik satellite was launched, there was a rush to develop maths and science education uh, within the, uh, the uh, OEC member countries. Uh, and there's quite a lot of, of attention paid to, to, um, uh, <coughs> to education, uh, and, uh, which helped to, to sort of underline the shortcomings of, of, of the Irish system, in particular the very low levels of participation at, at second uh, and third level, uh, and, and so forth. Uh, <coughs> so uh, OEEC and, and later OECD, uh, essentially they, 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 they popularized this idea of, of the economics of education, the idea that education was a, was a key input into the process of economic growth. That the formation of human capital uh, uh, was, 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 was going to, was, was a key uh, uh, determinant of how fast you could, you could grow. So the more money you pumped into your education system and your human capital formation process, uh, the quicker you would grow. And that, uh, that became a hugely uh, influential idea. Again, reorientation uh, away from uh, religion away from Irish language revival, which were uh, absolutely predominant uh, concerns of, the, of, of those concerned of Irish education, and towards uh, science, technology, uh, modern languages. And the EPA was also responsible uh, for specialist, in, in the early years, for specialist education for Irish managers and trade unionists. Uh, the ICTU, for instance, when it, it, it's the reunification of the split Congresses took place in 1959. Uh, the, 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 the education officer position initially occupied by Barry Desmond uh, and the program uh, uh, that he, 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 uh, he, he ran, the education program, was financed by the EPA. Again, uh, with, uh, the, the, a lot of this was then with the end of the, the OEEC and the advent of the OECD. This was then domesticated. The Irish state took over uh, responsibility for funding these, uh, a lot of these activities and expanded the Irish National Productivity Committee uh, in the context of adaptation of Irish industry to the, uh, uh, the rigors of, of competition that it would face uh, when and if we uh, became EEC members. Right. Okay, now... In this context, I want to just say a word about the point we might call the, the union friendliness of USAID. US government agencies uh, during the, 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 from the late 40s and 50s, they wooed uh, the, the, what would term the free or non-communist uh, unions of, of Europe. Obviously, they, uh, they shunned the, 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 the red ones aligned with the uh, communist parties. Uh, and you find mutual security legislation of the, the, the uh, the, the Benton Amendment of the 1951 Act passed by Congress 
called for the development of the free labor union movements as the collective bargaining agencies of labor. So the, the US government is, is backing uh, free unions as the collective bargaining agencies. And a, a Moody amendment to the to a further tranche of legislation passed the following year, 52, uh, mandated the equitable sharing of the benefits of increased production and productivity between consumers, workers, and owners. This is the, 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 this, this tripartite uh, formula of the politics of productivity. US trade union officials were very strongly represented alongside those drones from business, academia, and elsewhere on the staff of the, uh, the agencies of the, um, uh, the agencies running the Marshall Plan and, and, and collaborating with the, um, the, uh, the EPA. Now, however, the story takes a darker turn. Uh, the USA uh, really goes from being union friendly in these immediate post-war decades to being uh, somewhat close to being union free. From the 1930s to the 1960s, uh, I suppose the era, of, era of very much of the, the New Deal, uh, uh, and then the New Deal very much was projected onto the Marshall Plan and the way and the manner in which it functioned. Uh, the U.S. corporate mainstream mostly uh, uh, accepted unions as a, an inevitable fact of life uh, and negotiated with them. However, thereafter, a non-union environment became a strategic ob objective of, 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 of corporate America. To quote Koshin Katz and McCarthy's book uh, from 1994, the coverage and appeal of the traditional collective bargaining system in the United States continues to shrink. No new industries, new employers, or growing occupations have been organized by traditional unions in recent decades. And uh, Freeman and Medoff, two uh, labor economists from Harvard, uh, dubbed this in their book, uh, they called it the, stro the slow strangulation of private sector unions uh, as being in progress. Now, uh, turning back to Ireland and, and uh, this, this, this switch in uh, American corporate philosophy, uh, how was it affected? Uh, well, the Republic uh, was seeking to attract foreign direct investment from the, the 1950s, uh, but up to 1970s, most of what they brought in was European in origin. Uh, US projects were more likely, in fact, to be located north of the border, the Northern Ireland Department of Commerce. Uh, was, was probably the, the most successful agency in this regard. In the 1970s, uh, a revamped IDA, uh, it was uh, revamped after uh, being examined by the consultants A.D. Little at the end of the 1960s, uh, and moved away from a civil service caution uh, to, to a much more entrepreneurial type of culture. Uh, and it started making inflows into the flow of US foreign direct investment, which had really passively gone towards the UK regions uh, up until that point, but now the IDA started diverting it uh, into the Irish Republic. The agency was, it was, pretty, it was reason, pretty successful at this in the 70s, although the, uh, the, the, this was counterbalanced by massive losses the, uh, the, that, uh, that um, uh, it, the existing uh, uh, industry was, was suffering in, in, in e, EC membership conditions. Uh, now, the IDA found they were going tougher in the 1980s and was subjected to a great deal of criticism, uh, particularly when you had a, a, at one stage in the mid-80s, both the um, protected industries continued to, to crumble and uh, the, the flow of investment uh, 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 fell away. However, in the 1990s, uh, the, 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 the situation changed, and uh, after the, Intel, the arrival of Intel, uh, so did many other major IT companies, and uh, similarly uh, after Google, uh, in a, a, a similar type of effect occurred. So, so from then on, you, you, it wasn't all uh, onwards and upwards. You had major uh, closures, such as, say, Digital in Galway or, or Dell in Limerick, uh, 10 years later, but those economies were not blighted by those closures. They, they seem to be able to absorb them, and, and, and the people working in those uh, factories uh, or plants uh, um, uh, found other uh, opportunities and, 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 uh, uh, and openings within a, a, a growing economy. So IT, pharmaceuticals, and medical devices form the core of a large, of what we're familiar with today as the large uh, US-owned FDI sector. Now, if you look at Irish industrial relations and U.S. corporations, 
the, the landmark is probably the 1968 strike of EI at the EI plant in, uh, in, in, um, in Shannon, uh, where the Irish Transport and General Workers Union uh, eventually secured uh, recognition. Now, there was a government committee of inquiry around that whose main uh, figure was a man called Con Murphy, a leading trade union, a leading industrial troubleshooter of the time. Uh, <coughs> The, after EI, you, you had a new norm emerging of foreign-owned plants having a single union uh, with which an agreement had been signed prior to a plant going into production. Uh, this type of arrangement uh, ran into criticism. People criticized, uh, criticized it as being a sweetheart deal. The workers had no say in which union they joined. They often found that, that, uh, that, 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 that the, the parts of the workforce were, were uh, uh, were excluded from, the, uh, from, from, from being the union members, uh, and issues that might, in other contexts, be open to bargaining uh, were closed off by the terms of the pre-production agreement. Uh, there was, uh, a, a, in, in some cases, there's membership grumbling about Marine Port and General Workers Union uh, was, was probably the, the, the worst uh, disaster this type of, of, of arrangement uh, suffered. Uh, but it also gave rise to a lot of inter-union friction. Uh, the uh, transport union was seen as, as getting uh, a, 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 an unduly large share of these new plants, uh, and certain unions felt that they were being blacklisted and, and uh, excluded by the, uh, by the IDA. Now, this, uh, the, 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 the sort of friction between unions became fairly irrelevant uh, uh, over the next uh, time uh, because uh, as a, essentially union avoidance structure, so the, the, whereas companies were for a period willing to, to go into uh, single union pre-production deals, uh, they increasingly were not willing to, to have anything to do with unions uh, and adopted uh, union avoidance strategies uh, and that became the, the norm. Um, now, what do you do when you've got a, 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 a union avoidance uh, a, a, and a union is seeking to, to gain recognition and, and finding that recognition withheld? Well, since the 1930s, the U.S. National Labor Relations Board uh, <coughs> has, has resolved union recognition disputes by holding uh, certification ballots, by you know, a ballot deciding whether the union uh, seeking recognition was to get it or not. Now, in recent decades, uh, unchecked abuses on the part of employers, principally the victimization of activists, have tainted these ballots and kept uh, unions at bay. So the unions have been very much on the back foot in the United States. There is a statutory recognition uh, procedure, uh, but it's uh, riddled with the defects and uh, unions have not really uh, been able to, 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 to hold their own uh, within that context. Irish workers have a constitutional right to join a union, but Irish law doesn't require employers to recognize or negotiate with unions their employees join, uh, so there's no right to collective bargaining. And that's very unusual uh, in the, the European or North American context. It's uh, possibly unique. Um, the so long period of social partnership of the 1980s through to 2008 uh, failed to find an effective resolution mechanism to this. They avoided going for a straightforward, uh, uh, um, the statutory union recognition procedure and had a sort of a, a scenic uh, route through the labor court uh, was, was devised to, 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 uh, to try and uh, resolve disputes. Uh, but this was, uh, this was blown out of the water really uh, by the, um, uh, the, the Ryanair case uh, and the Supreme Court judgment on it, uh, which um, really dwelt, uh, uh, <coughs> made, the, made the whole uh, elaborate mechanism that had been uh, 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 devised to be quite uh, uh, inoperative uh, and uh, left the matter uh, to be addressed at a future occasion. Uh, the result was, was that this kind of slow strangulation of private sector unions that had been observed in the, the States uh, pretty much migrated across the Atlantic. Uh, there was an ongoing decline in, 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 in private sector density. Here are some figures from the uh, a, a, a chapter by Macaroni and Erin. This is from um, 
uh, a book, <coughs> at the latest uh, European Trade Union Institute volume, uh, it's entitled Trade Unions in the European Union, uh, picking up the pieces of the neoliberal challenge, and it was published earlier this year, uh, and uh, they, 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 they have these figures, again, you can see the, the dramatic decline in private sector density, and I think other people have even lower figures than this, uh, and they say that such a low level of trade union density was, was last seen in Ireland in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, so this is a, a pretty serious problem for the, uh, the, the, the trade union movement. Um, we've had organizing initiatives since the end of social partnership. Irish unions have drawn on international models such as the American Janitors for Justice uh, 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 movement, which, which um, very successfully organized uh, pr principally Hispanic workers in, in, in uh, in, in, in service industry, hotel, janitor type work in, in, in places like LA. Uh, and th they've been drawn on to launch organizing campaigns among precarious and non-standard workers in hotels, contract cleaning, uh, and, and care settings. Uh, you've also, the, the, that uh, uh, Macaroni and Urn uh, raised the question of whether they, they identify the main challenge in terms of unionization as remaining uh, the, the organization of workers in multinational companies, which play an ever-increasing role in the Irish economy. And they, they, they say that while recent developments in the US tech industry, such as the unionization drive of Google, might also have a positive impact in Ireland, or may be seen whether Irish unions will be able to capitalize on them. Now, there has been a, uh, a, a big, uh, really post-pandemic uh, uh, upsurge in, 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 in attempts to organize in the un United States, uh, uh, <clears throat> the, the, the formation of, a, of, a, of an alphabet, the, the Google parent company union, although that's a campaigning group within a bargaining union. But there have been, uh, uh, Amazon has been on the front line, uh, Starbucks, a lot of these kind of uh, household name companies. Uh, but the uh, hopes that, this, that, that there would be a breakthrough there that might sort of overspill into uh, th through uh, corporate culture into Ireland uh, are probably not very well founded. Uh, the, 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 uh, 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 I just quote here a, a headline and strapline from a Guardian story of earlier this year, which talks about old school union busting, how US corporations are quashing the new wave of organizing, victories at several companies energized organizers but hostile corporations, and an impotent labor board stymie negotiations. So the same old uh, uh, story, really, uh, that this newest wave of, of organizing has run into the same tactics of, of uh, victimization, bad faith bargaining, captive audience meetings, and so forth. Uh, the, the, the same old anti-union playbook uh, seems to be uh, pushing them back as it pushed back earlier waves. So <clears throat> what are the prospects? Is, is positive legal change on the horizon? Uh, for the USA, Posit uh, probably not. Uh, there seems to be that there is a. There's really no prospect. It, it seems at the moment of getting uh, uh, legislation to the two houses of Congress uh, that would uh, deal with the, uh, the, the the shortcomings of the National Labor Relations Act. Um, uh, so there, there are ongoing efforts to do this, but it's not not working. Uh, for Ireland, uh, maybe there may be the changes. There's the recent EU minimum wage directive, which embraces increased collective bargaining coverage, uh, and uh, there's the process for good faith engagement at the enterprise level, which has been recommended by the uh, Labour Employer uh, <coughs> uh, Forum high-level group on collective bargaining in 2022. So there's, uh, there's some, there are things uh, happening uh, in Ireland that, that might lead to some improvement in the Union. Uh, uh, again, there's a session on social dialogue, I think, on Sunday, uh, which one might look at uh, to see that. Um, so I think that, obviously, we're not going to predict the future. <laughs> it's a dangerous business, uh, uh, and um, it, it's, 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 it's easier, though not, uh, not that easy, uh, to look back on the past. And perhaps just to finish, uh, one might say that uh, the, the, uh, the, the, this, the wages directive and the, 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 uh, the high level group report appear to look like uh, European uh, institutions being brought in to uh, uh, address the, um, 
the, 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 the excesses of, of, of American corporate uh, culture. Uh, and, uh, <coughs> but uh, perhaps if one looks at Americanization more broadly and over a longer historical period, one can also see that there are ideas uh, such as particularly this, this, uh, uh, the, the, the sharing of the benefits between, uh, the, the, the equitable sharing of benefits between different parties, which was very much at the center of the, uh, the US aid provision in the, in the 50s and early 60s, uh, which fed into the European uh, uh, ideas of, on social dialogue and, and other ideas and wider ideas on social partnership, uh, which are uh, at work in this minimum wage directive uh, and, and in the, uh, the, 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 the LEFF group. Uh, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> and if you don't mind, we'll move straight on to Tom and then we'll do Q&A afterwards. Um, so th this, this is a name that, you know, uh, anybody who studied industrial relations quotes Turner on a regular basis, so now it's good to hear Turner rather than to actually have to read all the chapters. So, um, okay, um, yeah. okay, hello. Um, <coughs> this is a slightly different approach to my usual kind of work. So I'm hoping that it provides some interest to people out there. Um, it's about political changes and ideology. And it's about state ownership of business in Ireland. So in a sense, this is about capitalism and where it's going. And I was hoping maybe at the end, I, some people will have some ideas, something to contribute to this particular debate. Uh, so we we'll start off. Now, the background to this paper was that when we look at various opinion polls uh, from the BBC, from the Pew Centre in the United States, we find that people are not particularly happy with capitalism. What they mean by capitalism, of course, not defined all that well, but they're not happy with the current economic system, we might say. Now, despite this, and most contemporary polls as well show a high level of dissatisfaction, we also find from other survey evidence that when people are asked about inequality, a huge proportion say that inequality has grown and that their governments don't do enough to reduce inequality. So two questions are interrelated, as we'll see. Uh, despite this cr critique of capitalism, despite this cr critique of the current economic system, we find not too many solutions coming up, certainly not from a practical point of view. We get certain a number of ideological aspects, but few practical solutions seem to occur. And I'll come back to that point at the very end. Now, most of us have grown up those of us who are retired are getting to that age. We've seen the debates over state ownership being central to political debates in the 20th century. And they revolved around the notion that from a, the Marxist socialist point of view, the state should own all productive forces and the extraction services as well. All the economic activity should be controlled and owned by the state. We also saw the development of social democracy, which aimed towards a mixture of the, not taking the complete socialist approach, but the notion of controlling the commanding heights of the economy. This was a great term back in the 60s when the Labour Party came into power in the UK. Was that the state should control the commanding heights of the economy so that you would really dictate the main economic activity. On the other hand, of course, we always had a strong element, a conservative element, a laissez-faire element. Those who are committed to the principles of laissez-faire, right-wing conservative parties. And so 
we had this mixture going through. This debate went on throughout the 20th century and from the late 19th century, in fact, but throughout the 20th century, this debate tended to go on. However, as the century wore on, in particular, the more radical solutions suggested by Marx and Socialist Party tended to uh, tended to be reduced, tended to disappear, basically because the kind of societies that where you had communist parties in control and you had complete ownership of the means of production appeared to be not just inefficient and ineffective economically, but quite oppressive in terms of human rights as well. So against this context, this paper sets out to examine whether that that because it gets a bit complicated but uh, basically I looked at the post-war generation those born before 1945 and the idea is that people, their political formative age is pe between the ages of 15 and 25. Generally, that's what the literature comes out with. So, people born pre-war, the first generation. Second generation I examined was those born after 45. And therefore, they would have been called the 60s generation because between the age of 15 and 25, they would have been going through the 60s. So they were the 60s generation, and then the last generation are those born in the 1980s, and they would have been seen as being part of that generation, which was associated with the rise of the neoclassical era, the, the neoliberalism and the, the increasing uh, principles of free enterprise. Now the data comes from the European Values Survey, and you can see it's it's just three waves. The last wave is 2008 and 2010. It's a bit out of date, but it is the last survey that I have. Also, the question that was asked, which was, how do you feel about private? Should private enterprise be increased or should state ownership of business be increased? And they were at the end, it was a scale from one to 10. This kind of question, by the way, again, doesn't appear in surveys anymore, which is instructive in its sense. Uh, so in, in addition, the, the, the three groups, are, the 10 point scale is divided into three, makes it easier to understand. So on one hand, you have those who favor uh, private ownership increasing, those who think it's just fine, uh, there shouldn't be changed. And the last group are those who feel State ownership should be increased. So if we look at these particular the results here, you can see across the three surveys, first of all, if you take the, the three waves together. And if we look if we look at the three waves and the three waves put together, you can see that the, the majority actually favour an increase in private enterprise in ownership, uh, with a decrease in state ownership. In the center, you have another third who feel that it's just right the way it is. And, and, and on the other hand, in, ter in terms of only 15% favoring the increase in state ownership. Now, I'll come back I may say something about the question itself. And on reflection myself, the word state ownership is a loaded question. The word state is a loaded term. And I'm not too sure if you changed the, the word state to say community ownership or social ownership, you might get a, quite, a bit of a different result. And I'll come back to that as well at the end. So if we look at the three generations, 
pre-post-war 60s generation and the 80s generation, you can see that there's been a slight decrease in the proportion who favor an increase in private ownership. On the other hand, there's also been a decrease in those who favor state ownership. And the, the glaring fact is that there's a very small proportion of people across all the generations actually favor state ownership. So if we look at the ownership by ideology, so the ideology question split into three groups again, left orientation, middle, and the right orientation. And you can see that certainly there's more on the left favor state ownership, as you'd expect, but it's still only 22% compared to 15% who are on the right. Again, what jumps out here is that very few people favor state ownership, even on the left. Now, when we look back, this in fact explains why, for instance, all of the social democratic parties during the 1990s took out any clauses in their policy documents referring to ownership of the commanding heights of the economy. So in the UK, under Tony Blair, that particular article was taken out of their constitution. So most of the parties took away, they have no, nothing about state ownership anymore. Okay, I'll go on. Now, so what we've seen is that there's no support that significant attitudes, there's a difference in the generations. There was very small differences. In general, what we find is people on the left are more likely, uh, people in the 60s generation are slightly more likely to favor state ownership, but it, it's not dramatic. Uh, and the shift is really towards the center where people say, well, it's okay, we don't want any less or we don't want any more. Now, when we look at the left respondents, as we've seen, it's relatively weak relationship, which is surprising. We would expect people on the left to say they want more state ownership. Uh, barely a fifth of respondents on the left favored increased state ownership, which is very, quite small, really. Nearly 50% on the left preferred increasing state ownership. Don't ask me why this should occur. It's quite dramatic. And uh, perhaps it tells us something about why Labour parties, social democratic parties, shifted their economic policies. Uh, okay, but nevertheless, there was still a proportion on the left, a small proportion, are a greater number who favored state ownership. Now, the conclusions are, some of the implications are that state ownership of the means of production is unlikely to feature am among political parties to any great extent. Now, this is a paradox, as we see in a moment, because state involvement in the economy and society is increasing. Uh, challenges to a capitalist free market are likely to arise from a different direction. And my argument would be that the sustainability of capitalism is the problem. And that it's not sustainable where you have dwindling resources and you have climate change. We're told by the scientists, for example, of climate change that we have to move towards a sustainable economy. Now, a sustainable economy is an economy where this generation leaves the same resources to the next generation. This is not possible where you have an economy that's built on the exploitation of resources, higher productivity, producing more goods, selling more goods. That's capitalism. It does not, it's not, compatible with the changes that we're expected to make to avoid climate destruction. And 
I want to make a number of observations then, looking back at the kind of results we've had. But first of all, the idea of calling, we should be wary of the word state. And I think that people react negatively to the word state. I think when we substitute social or community ownership, you're likely to get more buy-in from people. Then there's challenges, as I've mentioned, of the circular and carbon-free economy. It does not gel with, for example, if we look at multinationals, what are multinationals trying to do? They're trying to increase their profits, they're trying to sell more products, they're trying to expand their markets, use more materials, and it's, it, it, it's going to raise serious issues about how we deal with the future. Only states can comprehensively manage these kind of issues. And if I might say, uh, in recent times, and I'll come back to the trade union movement, where does it figure in all of this? I think the trade union movement has to take positions on where the state should be involved. For example, take the energy sector. We have an energy sector now which we're building up on renewables offshore winds farms. In the recent auction, which was carried about, I think it happened in May, four companies won the contracts to build the offshore wind farms, mainly on the East Coast. Two of them were Irish private firms, and two of them were foreign firms, a French firm and a Norwegian firm. But the French firm and a Norwegian firm are state companies. So we're, we're, we're giving up our energy, free energy, by the way, wind is free, and we have, we're not going to own our own energy, which provides a lot of security. And by the way, if you own your own energy and you're producing your own energy, you can sell it cheap to business. It's, it's a win-win for everybody. So in that sense, there are, when we come to state ownership, there are issues which we need to address and which the trade union movement needs to develop a policy on a, a huge range of state areas for I don't think anything will replace capitalism. What will happen is that from a pragmatic perspective, the state will become more involved in time to come and we'll have to run quite a number of areas. We'll have to regulate a lot of areas. The free market won't disappear, but it will shrink and it will have a lot more regulation. Anyway, these are the kind of ideas we need to think about for the future. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. Um, so both interesting and, and you know, actually con quite connected in some ways. You see that rise of influence of, um, you know, or, or the, the diminishing of influence of the trade union movement and then increase in capitalism. Um, so if we take questions from the floor quickly or observations. Now, I can't necessarily see everybody. I think that's Mick O'Reilly up there. Yeah, you want to go first, Mick?
demonstration of 100,000 people who were objecting to the fact that Marshal Tito had put step in, who was a, 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 a Catholic a bishop who collaborated with the Nazis uh, in Yugoslavia. And a fellow called Hubert Butler was sent to the United Nations to go there to try to learn. And he said, the trial was fair in everything, but it wasn't like the jurisprudence of Britain or Ireland. It was different. Yugoslav justice given up by the partisan army, and he was he was he was jailed. But the point is, simultaneously to that, and this makes it like such a contradiction in in in, in Ireland. We, when we one of the few countries that didn't join uh, NATO, all the other countries did. All the socialists, where, where, where when the government joined the Europe, they all joined NATO. We didn't, and yet we had this other demonstration. I think it's a it's a an indication. So, can we get Mike down here? Right. Sorry, if you want to mind giving your name as well. Uh, my name is Brian. I was just going to ask Peter um, if I could get a copy of his notes. I'll I couldn't really understand him when he walked away from the microphone. I've got hard of hearing. And I, when he walked away, I couldn't really hear him properly. So I lost about half of his legs. I'm sorry. Okay. So if there's any way I can get like we catch up with what he was saying. No worries. We'll make sure that you Thank you. I think they will be available anyway to everybody. We'll just make sure about that. Okay. I can't see who it is. Sorry, over there. Thank you, uh, Michelle O'Sullivan. Um, I have uh, two questions for Tom. Uh, thanks very much, Tom. It was really interesting, um, and to Peter as well. But to, to Tom on your paper, in terms of the methodology, do you think that it would make a difference if the question was asked, if people were asked about state ownership of specific things? So, for example, if, if, would they be in favor of state ownership of banks? Do they think it would be state ownership of energy, etc.? The second one is, I wonder, and maybe I haven't gotten around to this yet, but I wonder, particularly for the 2010 survey, it's a bit surprising that the answers um, don't change that much in terms of favorship for state ownership, given that's you know, in the middle of the global financial crisis. And I wonder, is there a difference between countries in views, where the, where in those countries like Ireland and Greece and so on, who are more badly affected by the global financial crisis? I wonder, would there be any difference in people's attitudes there versus in other European countries where they weren't so badly affected? Thank you. Okay, yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, certainly. Um, asking about different aspects of the economy would make a big difference, I think. And. Um, Certainly, if we had owned the banks, we would have saved ourselves a lot of money, <laughs> about 40 billion. Uh, so there is, again, and I think coming back to the, nobody disputes the ownership of, say, our schools, our health and our education, but there's still private sectors in those as well. Uh, I think the utilities are major areas that people should control. I don't think there's much doubt about that. That doesn't mean we can't have a market, but it just means we control the really important areas that, that uh, are very necessary 
to combat the kind of challenges that we face, the global challenges and the, the environmental challenges, which are probably existential challenges when all said and done. So they're very important. I do think that, again, if you phrase the questions in a different way, uh, you might get slightly better answers. Coming back to the 2008-2010 uh, European Value Survey, the survey was probably carried out just before the financial crash, and certainly, you know, during it, and it didn't, it wouldn't have captured how people feel now. So, uh, it's unlikely that we would get the true attitude change from the financial crisis. But even so, I'm not sure whether we'd get significantly different outcomes in a survey. The question is not asked very much. I think that people should be asked the question. I think that's democracy as well, if you ask people what they want. But it's rarely asked, and there's no debate. For example, in the energy sector, there's no debate, there's very little debate. There's a couple of people in the doll have raised the questions. People before profits have raised the issues about ownership. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of a, a, a I can't understand it myself why it isn't a major debate in the uh, in the doll that we don't own and control our ownership, particularly after what's happened in the last three or four years. It's astonishing. Energy, energy security is everything. And not only if we own our own energy, and we're going to be a major exporter when we get all our wind farms up, then we're going to make money. How do we pay our pensions in the future? We pay it by selling off our energy. So there's lots of things that can be done and changes that can be made. And the debate isn't, to my mind, at the political level, is not sharp enough at the moment anyway. I hope. Now, unless I'm uh, misinterpreting Marx and Eng Engels, communism to them was a definition of community ownership and not state ownership. Communism as it was, you know, in my interpretation of reading Marx and Eng Engels, that communism was community ownership and not state ownership. I think we have put uh, communism into state ownership that it shouldn't be there. Okay, we'll move on from that. I, historically, since the first industrial revolution and the revolutions that have taken place and the strikes and everything that have taken place, yo, know, from the first up now to the fourth industrial revolution, that people who have settled into a situation for the generation are only really in a situation to either strike, revolt, or that, when life becomes for them and their families and their communities and a country totally intolerable to actually continue to live and to continue to live with a mechanism that manages the apparatus of the state. Now, I read Picardy Capital and then Capital Ideology. And if anybody wants to know about capitalism and how they conduct themselves and what's a uh, situation and how do you manage the whole known world that we know it, that is certainly a book, a two books to be actually read and need to be read. So can we work alongside capitalism for the next five, 10, 15 or 20 years and reach a situation where we have uh, social justice uh, state or 
our communities? Will capitalism work along with us to actually achieve that? It doesn't seem that way before. Now, since 2008 and before it, capitalism and the financial uh, apparatus of this world knew, and I've seen the documents from 2003, both here in Ireland and other places, that they knew what was facing them, a total economic and financial collapse. Now, they have torn, turned that into a situation where it actually serves their purpose. It is no up, uh, it's not new to me that when capitalism is under threat by society, certainly it's not, it just doesn't happen that you have a war and a world war. This happened in the First World War when capitalism was in a, in a major problem. It happened, yes, in the Second World War. It's in a big problem at the moment. How does it keep the hold on the people that are going to suffer in the next uh, couple of years. And ergo, we are now threatened with a world war and a nuclear war to frighten us into a situation that we won't be able to take any type of action. I think we have to take that. And as well as that, I don't think that capitalism has ever and has ever any intentions of just walking away and giving us, in order to have a just society, the natural situations within that society that are actually needed. We either accept that we're fighting capitalism and we have to fight it with what used to be called communism and socialism, I now call it social justice. We have to determine which side of the coin that we were actually actually on. You can't have both. You can't be dancing with capitalism, looking for socialism, social justice, and not getting it. If you're looking for social justice, you have to take on the apparatus that actually controls that. And the only control that you can have worldwide at the moment is take the money from the 1% and the 10%. We are at a situation in the 21st century and the fourth industrial revolution that we, the working people, and no matter what our profession is, and what our uh, social uh, position in society is. We're not one of the 1%, we're not one of the 10%. And as an entity, and as uh, Marx said, when they got rid of the aristocracy and everything, we have come to a stage in history that we can no longer afford to have this pe these people around. We can no longer afford, in my opinion, Sorry. to have capitalism. Can we speakers very briefly to, to answer well, the, 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 the problems of the world. Yeah. Um, uh, first of all, um, I think the state is at the centre of what's going to happen in the future. I mean, that's one thing that has, has come to be really, uh, it's, character, it's, it's something that we all realise now, that the state can do a lot. It has the power. It's democracy. Um, um, and I think that, leaving aside your first question about Marxism and community, it, in practice, it was always the state that held the ownership of the means of production. In, in any communist society, it was the state, that, not the community. Um, but coming back just briefly on your, your main point there, that the state, and we are in a democracy, has the power to change things. And my own belief, because none of us can see into the future, and you do have crises that occur that we, no one can predict, but it is likely 
to my mind, I don't think there's going to be any revolution. I don't think you're going to shift the wealth from the 1% and spread it out everywhere. That's not going to happen, not immediately. It's going to take a long time. Uh, but I do think that there are certain constraints in our environment now. And I'm talking about the, the whole existential aspect of climate change that are going to force states to do things that they never did in the past. That's what I think. I think in, in the future, they're going to have to move in areas where it wasn't considered normal in the past. And that might even be conservative parties as well. So what I'm saying is that demands of the environment are going to drag societies along to some extent. Because I don't think nobody can write a script for how we face up to climate change. And it might get worse. So we, we don't, but all, all I can say is that the state is going to be at the center. And that's a big change from the period we've just come through, this neoliberal period, when the state was seen as, uh, as having no role, practically, in the economy or society. I think that's changed dramatically. And I think it will have a big role in the future. Thanks for that, Tom. Peter, do you want to come in on that idea? Can I just apologise to the uh, person uh, who, who couldn't hear me for my movements away from the microphone? Um, uh, just the first, could I respond to the first sure. comment? Um, I think, yes, the, 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 you refer to the purge of, of communists in the US trade union movement, uh, and uh, there was a clear, you know, the, the, the Marshall Plan was certainly about uh, drawing a clear line between uh, a sort of capitalist or liberal democratic West and, and, and communist to the East, um, and a, make a clear break between the, 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 the sort of the wartime alliances and, and, and the, the, the post-war uh, uh, realignment uh, there. And that, that, that's perfectly clear, you know, it was perfectly clear that, that you had free unions who were good and red unions who were bad, and, and that um, the, the uh, you know, the, the, the pushing of communists out of uh, Western governments after the war was, was very much a, a, a part of that. Um, you refer to, uh, I think, Yugoslavia. Um, the Yugoslavia was actually, and, and perhaps it's a, 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 a slight, uh, <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's, it has relevance to the, um, uh, the, the, the last uh, uh, speaker's um, contribution there. I mean, th that was, I mean, th they broke with Stalin in the, uh, in, in the early 1950s, uh, and by the, 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 the late 1950s, uh, they had developed a sort of an idea of self-managed socialism, uh, which I think was a, almost a, a, a third way sort of thing. But they'd also moved into, kind of almost into the orbit, they, they had quite, reasonably clo much closer relations than other so-called communist countries uh, with the, 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 the Western bloc, the, the OECD, OEC countries, uh, and were even in, uh, recipients of, of some degree of technical assistance from them. Um, so so the, you know, the, the, there was quite a, a, a complex, uh, you know, the, 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 the Yugoslav thing was, 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 um, uh, was quite fluid. Uh, but, but there was definitely a, 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 a line drawn between the, the Eastern Soviet bloc and the, um, uh, the, the Western countries by the Marshall Plan. So thank you both so much for two excellent uh, presentations. I think you'll all agree. Um, perhaps we'll give a round of applause. And um, we have to vacate quickly because I get signals from the sidelines. <laughs>